All right. Today we welcome Greg Carl with the Skeptico. Greg is the creator and host of the Higher Side Chats podcast, a popular and very influential alt media kind of thing that explores all manner of things that most people would lump into that category we so lovingly call conspiracy theory. And since Greg lives right here in San Diego, as I do, I have the great pleasure of having Greg sitting right across the table from me. And this is really cool. I've never done this. So I don't know how it's going to go. We might wind up at blows or, you know, you might see a fight. My fight might break out. Anything could happen here. That's That's what makes it great. So, uh, Greg, first off, it's so great to have you. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. Thank you, man. It's a real pleasure. I love your show also. Great. I love that mutual admiration society stuff. So where I thought we might start, because I haven't really heard this in any of the interviews I've listened to that you've done, the couple that you've done, or in the interviews that you've given, is, you know, what was the first conspiracy? What was the first thread on that sweater that you pulled that kind of started you down this path? Well, I was always just rebellious in general. I loved punk music, which is very anti-authoritarian. So early on, I was always, and I went to also a a really rigid private school. Um, So I was anti-authority from a young age. And I guess I was always looking for uh, excuses to keep that worldview or to validate it. And so when you start digging into what authority is usually doing, which is, you know, abusing people, abusing their position and the people below them, I'm starting to have a lot of backup information. So it really solidified me as just being anti-establishment growing up, but it had to be 9-11. I really? mean, you know, it's kind of cliche. Everybody says that now, but I mean, I was in high school still. And we come in and everybody gets in the gym and they announce this thing and we see it on TV. And even that day, I was like, that doesn't really look right. Really? Yeah, I was like, that doesn't look right. And I had a couple of good friends who, you know, we could never offend each other. We loved the most offensive comedy. So I knew like I wasn't going to lose a friendship over bringing that up. And we would be like, yeah, it's a little odd. But it kind of went away. And then later... Loose Change, the documentary came out and my buddy's like, dude, this thing, you know, we didn't think it looked right. Here's somebody who's like, yeah, it doesn't look right. This is, you know, there's a big conspiracy here. It could be an inside job. And that was kind of what set me off. I was like, no, 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 it's not abstract anymore. You know, it's very real. And I'd say, you know, as cliche as it is, 9-11 was the first conspiracy that, that really set me off. I mean, I had an interest in UFOs and the kind of the fringy coast to coast stuff. Right. But that of course was also abstract. But so so when you got into 9-11, was it more or less immediate that you dove into the level of saying, oh shit, this is really big? Or or how did it kind of because I mean, I'll tell you mine. <clears throat> so I'm off doing Skeptico, you know, and I think I'm just kind of pursuing big picture science. Who are we? Why are we here? And I'm interested in that from a spiritual part too. And I'm just not approaching it from a cons- conspiratorial thing at all. But I start seeing more of this stuff crop up and I'm kind of drawn into it. So I start backfilling that. And where I started was with JFK because I really want to play it safe, honestly. And I'm a I'm of a different generation than you are, but it, it, it was way in the in the rearview mirror, JFK. It was safe. But I remember being done with it and talking to my wife and going, oh, shit, you know, this stuff goes really deep, but there is no way I could ever believe like that 9-11 stuff. I mean, that's just like way too far out there. And I wonder if you had a similar kind of experience of going, you know, okay, you know, here's the limit. Oh, wait, the limit's now further, the limit's now further. And was it like that for you with 9-11? Were you immediately jumping in and saying, wow, this is like dramatically different than what I thought? Well, yeah, I mean, I am pretty open to new paradigms pretty quickly. And I like, you know, to kind of challenge that. And I've given up on saying that, you know, putting my foot down on certain ideas and beliefs because it always ends up changing. You know, it always ends up advancing. But what I found most interesting about the going down the 9-11 rabbit hole was when my buddy brought up this documentary, we were in kind of a large group of friends we'd all grown up with and it split the room like nothing I've ever seen. And here I am with friends I've known my whole life 
And we've never really had serious emotionally charged arguments about anything real. And we bring up 9-11 and that it could have been an inside job and, you know, elements of the government are involved and we've been lied to in the media and it just split the room. I, there were people who were like, I won't watch that documentary. I don't want to hear you guys talking about that documentary. And that's when I realized I was like, whoa, maybe I am a little different, you know, to be able, because I hear that and I want to hear more about it. I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. that's intriguing. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's kind of what the show is. And sometimes people make their case and it's great and it really does make you think. And sometimes it falls short of that. But I really love those um, kind of mind benders that kind of take you, move you further down the field in terms of it's all a big grand conspiracy. I like kind of messing with, shaking people up and messing with them a little bit. But that was the first time I ever saw in a real way. I was like, wow, like, wh why are you so against the idea of looking at a documentary that suggests something strange? And then I was just like, wow, I guess half the people I grew up with are just different and they're, they're never going to go down this rabbit hole. And maybe there's some conditioning there. Hmm. Well, that's, that is interesting. And you know, that's, you, you have just kind of led into the higher side chats show. And what I thought, what I thought might, I might do is play for people a little bit of a compilation of some intros that you do. You do fantastic intros. Nice. I mean, there's a show I, I have to say, I can't be fanboy the whole time, but I've got to be a little bit of fanboy. You do great research before the show. You put together these intros that really kind of head out the, the landscape of where you're heading. And then there's some really cool music in there too that we can get into. <laughs> I'm going to play this is mainly for your benefit to hear it. I'll slice, splice in a better version. I think really makes some great connections between ancient aliens and ancient history, the races and blood types, the elite and the bloodlines, the inner earth and abductions, reptilian beings and a century-long manipulation of humanity, and a thousand other threads on the conspiracy sweater. By now we know all too well that hidden behind the facade of democracy are the dynastic families that make up the bricks and mortar of the power pyramid. Groomed from a young age, pre-approved for the finest schools, and inducted into their elusive and exclusive secret societies, we see the same names and faces fast-tracked to wealth, power, and control, while the rest of us are force-fed the American dream like an overstuffed Christmas goose. But on a show where we regularly flip through the Rolodex of entity influence, today we're going to narrow in on a slice of the pie where we don't often consider the role or possibilities of such manipulations, and that's love and relationships. Okay. Where would we be without THC? I have sung that song in my head uh, many times. It is kind of a catchy song. But so you, we've just laid out there, I mean, just an array of things that I think, uh, no doubt, some people are going to find paradigm busting just in the way that you're talking about. I mean, we're talking about not only UFOs, but then alien abduction, which for me, I never understand why the people, why people can't make that step. They go, oh, yeah, well, I believe that UFOs are a reality, but alien abduction, that could never happen. It's like, uh, why is that such a leap? I mean, the first one I get is a leap, but the second one. But then you even go to the to the Milab thing, you know, which is the military abduction of people, the cooperation of government or military organizations. And we don't really know what those are being somehow involved in this process, too. Again, that's just going to be a moonshot to people. But what I think is really interesting about in that compilation I did, you always you also do some really down to earth, if you will, kind of geopolitical political stuff that is still pulling those same threads of the sweater, yeah. as you said, and I copied you. And for example, that was a lead into an interview you did with Russ Baker. Here's, I guess, the question in that. How do you balance those out to yourself? And what, what do you see as the, the guiding force behind, you know, both dealing with the extreme stuff that's way out there that totally destroys all our paradigms and then also winding it back to you know why is hillary doing this and where are the bushes playing out in that scenario well i think it was john rapaport one time i interviewed him and he had said you know when you're looking at a lot of this stuff it just depends what level on the elevator you want to get off you know you can get really weird or you can be in the down-to-earth stuff and it doesn't mean one negates the other. You know, both things can really be going on. And I think uh, I have a tendency to, like, get weirder and weirder and weirder. And then I'll get to a point where I'm like, okay, 
are we really learning anything here when we're talking about spider beams, you know, coming from uh, Zeta Reticuli and the moon is a control center? It's interesting. It's an interesting paradigm I'll talk about. But where, you know, what, what can you do with that in your life? And so then I'll be like, okay, let's get back to uh, something more down to earth. And then I'll have a guess like Russ Baker or William Engdahl, and we'll get more into the political side of things. But I think that's kind of what it is, is I, I get maybe too far off and then I bring it back. But I like having the show be a grab bag of stuff where there's an audience that appreciates, you know, what I do. They're going to trust me. I kind of consider myself a conspiracy talent scout. Like I, I scout out the researchers. And I'm like, okay, this guy, he makes a good case for his position and have them on and let them do their thing and kind of walk, help walk them through their own research because it's often very dense. It's where the intros come in. You know, you got to get, uh, it takes a lot to set up some of these people because it's such dense stuff and it's so off the radar that you really got to frame it. It takes a lot of framing to kind of be like, okay, this is where we're going to go today. We're getting off on this level of the elevator today. Well, let's, let's walk some, let's walk people through some of that stuff because I think, some of the listeners to this show are probably already off the elevator. <laughs> they've, they've left as soon as it, yeah, they were like, Cheers Nope, I'm out of there. Uh, but because I keep pounding on these conspiracy theories, cause they seem to crop up everywhere and they seem to be, for me, they seem to be part of the personal transformation process. They seem to be not just a countercultural, let's go out and protest. They seem to be part of what I need to be able to go forward with what is essentially a spiritual thing. You know, it's like, who am I? Why am I here is really spiritual questions. Yeah. We disguise them as science questions, but they're really spiritual questions. So if you start with 9-11, right, that was your starting point. Let's start there real briefly. What are, who are some of your favorite 9-11 guests that really solidify your understanding that, in simple terms, 9-11 was an inside job. 9-11 was not what we think it was. When it comes to guests, to be honest, that is one that by the time I was doing the show, like, I kind of had just accepted that. And uh, that's kind of, I haven't really gone back and fundamentally gone into I'll tell you what, you did, Judy Wood. you did a great job. <laughs> I was just going to say, you did a great job with Judy Wood. You yeah, did a thank, great job with Judy you. Wood. Yeah, she has been the only one, I think, that has moved the needle further to, into understanding what it could have been, or if it wasn't a controlled demolition, she seems to have, I think, really good evidence to suggest that it was something more than that. She refers to it as a dustification. <laughs> the thing that I thought was most interesting is the seismic data that she pulls up. Now, I mean, I haven't gone to the primary seismic data and made sure that hers is exactly right, but taking her at her word, and her book is like a textbook on 9-11. Yes. It's not flowery language whatsoever. It's hard science. Yes. And, um, you know, the seismic data from that day does not show the impact of t tons of steel hitting the ground and creating, like, vibrations. It doesn't show that. It just, it basically shows nothing. So her theory or her premise is, like, all this material did not collapse into the ground. It kind of vaporized. And she has pictures that show certain things like the spire, uh, she'll frame by frame, like it doesn't just topple over. And this is something that wasn't touched by a plane. It's a part of, you know, it's on the top of the tower. It should remain stable all the way down until it hits the ground and like shatters or whatever. But it kind of, va it falls apart and mystifies in, in, in the air. And so you look at that stuff and you're like, well, you got to come up with some kind of answer. Why isn't there a giant impact? You know, she talks about something called the bathtub, which is, you know, the twin towers are built down into the ground and there's this cement bathtub like structure that keeps the water from coming in because it's right there on the coast. And why didn't that fall apart? And why wasn't Manhattan just flooded? Well, there wasn't an impact. And so that's some information that you have to kind of come up with an answer for. She thinks it's exotic, uh, free energy type technology that just breaks things apart at a molecular level. And I think there might be a case for that. Yeah. You know, the other thing that uh, I thought was just really interesting about the interview you did, and then we'll move on. But when she talks about the people who are actually walking down one of the stairwells yeah. and they look up and there's blue sky. 
So whatever was above them, and this is like, you know, a large number of people who were together and we could verify that they were there on the scene and they're saying, yeah, this is what happened. I'm, how do you get around that? You know, how about the jumpers too. Like that's a little <clears throat> dark, but she talks about the jumpers and that was something that didn't really seem right to me either. I'm like, I understand that a plane hit the building, but you know, unless you're right there on that level, why do you need to jump out? It, you know, people can say, Oh, come on. You know, it's filling with smoke. It's hot. But with her paradigm that this is more of like some type of microwave technology, some type of, uh, you know, crossing of frequency waves. It's like the people are jumping because they're like cooking when they're in this, uh, you know, in this net of these two crossing frequencies. And that to me, uh, obviously it's dark, but it made a lot more sense to see these people jumping out and I don't know, you know, some people are going to be like, that's too far or that's not necessarily super scientific, but it didn't seem right to me that people would be jumping out. I'm like, can't you wait a little longer to potentially get rescued or can't you climb down a little more? Um, you know, you only live once, you know, these things must be pretty bad if you're going to jump a uh, hundred stories. And I think the idea that they were getting cooked with some exotic technology paired with all this other information that she throws out there. I think it's anecdotal, but it kind of made a little more sense. What I think it should really give people a sense for, if they listen to that interview on Higher Side Chats, is that you're not afraid to go super scientific. I mean, if there's anything about Judy Wood, she puts people off because she's so kind of confrontational about the science because she is a scientist. She knows her stuff and she doesn't like people who don't know their stuff. You know, like she, I hear her lecturing people on uh, uh, reasoning, you know, your reasoning skills are not good. And you really kind of were able to kind of hold your ground there because I think you do have this pretty deep knowledge about the subject. And I felt the same way about when you talk about Russ Baker about the bushes. But the, the difference there, I think, is that 9-11 contains itself pretty well. You know, something happened to these buildings and there was a reason for it. And even if you go down the conspiratorial path like you and I do in a way that seems obvious that, hey, this was the event that started the war on terror. And why the hell wouldn't you want a war on terror? It's the best damn war in the world you could ever imagine. Unlimited budget. Who isn't afraid of terror? An unlimited end time. It ends when we say it ends. You know, we can get that script. What I found interesting about where you went with the Bush interview with Russ Baker is that it gets in a lot of ways a lot deeper and into some of the spiritual kind of what's going on on another level, bloodline thing and all of that stuff. Tell me what you took away from your investigation into the Bush family and into the Russ Baker thing and all this, all that stuff. Well, what I thought was great about Russ Baker is he wanted some answers to, you know, how did George W. Bush become president? Um, and he basically started researching the Bush dynasty, the Bush family. And um, he really equates most of their success to what he just calls networking, you know, really good, efficient networking. Doing business right. in Texas, right. Which uh, starts really, I mean... They were in Skull and Bones. That's what that thing is kind of made for. And I thought one point that he made that was really good is when you start bringing up these connections like Skull and Bones, people roll their eyes and they right. don't want to go there and they think it's not serious. But it's serious to the Bushes or they wouldn't have done it. These are very serious people and they have uh, a tendency to gravitate towards Bohemian Grove Club, the, you know, Skull and Bones, Freemasonry, these organizations that if you bring up those connections, you're the crazy conspiracy person. But it's a, it's a fact. It's not conjecture. They really were involved. You know, the aspect of, of that that I think is interesting is the blackmail aspect. You know, like if you're if you went to Skull and Bones in college and you're meeting all these prominent people that are also in the organization, and then you go on to, you know, eventually become president. If the rumors are true about things like the rituals in Skull and Bones, there's a guy out there who has a video of you jacking off in a coffin and crying about your worst sins, and you don't want that out there. 
So this guy has you from the age of 20 all the way to wherever you end up in the line. I think that's interesting. But the Bushes, I mean, they obviously they go back. Uh, what he brought up is they go back to the Civil War with selling fake munitions and stuff like that. Uh, one member of them would, uh, in the old days was a victim of the Salem witch trials. Like he, he got burned as a witch. Um, I thought that was interesting. The, the Gog and Magog stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with that necessarily or if we went into it too deep in the interview, but Magog is something from the Sumerian texts and that was, George W. Uh, or George Poppy Bush, George Sr.'s name in the Skull and Bones. So that gets into like manifesting these biblical prophecies, which seems to be a big part of what some conspiracy theorists think that these guys are doing is they're trying to force these uh, things that were written out a long time ago. They want to make it happen. I don't know why. That the, the Christian conspiracy theorists who think to chalk it all up to Satanism. That's not really my bag. I think that's a simplistic worldview, but you can't deny that they're doing something. Again, taking something very serious that if you bring it up in the mainstream, they'll roll their eyes about it. But they take these ancient things seriously. And, you know, there's researchers who, who go deep into 9-11 that it was ritualized to basically be a paradigm changer. And we, this post 9-11 world, I mean, I don't see us ever being in a post post 9-11 world, you know, like things definitely changed then. And when am I going to get to wear shoes through the airport? You know, when are, when are we ever going to be done with this? Like you said, it's the never ending story. Well, you, you know, you just covered some ground there that I thought was really great. And exactly what I want to kind of hone in on, because what you point out there is that if you take the Bush conspiracy at just kind of the surface level, like uh, Poppy's dad was a, a Nazi uh, a friend of the Nazis, Nazi banker. I mean, that's just proven. I mean, you just yeah. go look and see the damn documents. The only guy who was ever charged in that way. You know, that's really easy to kind of put your finger on. And the skull and bones thing is equally out there kind of thing. Where I think you're able to go that I don't see other people able to go is like you cross reference that with some of the UFO stuff and the abduction stuff, and in particular, the MILAB stuff, military abductions again of, of UFOs. And damn it, if it doesn't start popping up again, this idea of bloodlines seem to matter. This idea of uh, life commitments or life pledges or selling your soul, to use the term, seems to crop up. And we don't have to say we know what it is. But here are these people that are, like you just said, they believe it's real. Yeah. They're playing that game. And some of them are in some very strange places, like in the deepest bowels of military intelligence who are keeping secret, abducting people for purposes of some kind of alien contact. Right. And well, that's what got me into magic initially is I thought magic was a little out there. I didn't know if there was much to... Uh, you know, esoteric rituals and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, you look at the elite and they clearly pay attention to it. They clearly think it's important. What are we playing for here? What are you playing for? What is the ultimate end game for you in terms of the higher side chats? Because I get frustrated sometimes, like when I talk to somebody like uh, James Corbett, and we've both talked to him. I have a lot of respect for James unbelievable respect for what he does, the amount of information he puts out. But when we talked, you know, you push him on the end game and it's like, well, it's going to be volunteerism and we're all going to, you know, kind of anarchy is kind of okay. And I get that anarchy is, is, is really a misunderstood word and it really just means self-responsibility more than anything else. But doesn't it come down to something like uh, a majority rule, something like a democratic process. And in that sense, I worry about what you're advocating and what I'm advocating because we're going to have a hard damn time finding a majority. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what is the end game in this? Is it political or is it kind of a cultural transformation kind of? Well, I mean, my my end game with the show or what I'm trying to do with the show is just to get people to entertain radical ideas because I felt 
relatively isolated in the Midwest going over a lot of these ideas. You know, it split friendships I had for a decade because they couldn't bear to look at it. So I was like, let's present this stuff. Um, you know, let's build basically a digital stage, put these researchers on it in a way that's not interrupted by a bunch of commercials or, uh, you know, George Norrie's conservative religious viewpoint. And I, I like getting people to entertain that stuff. But the end game really, I, I, I don't know. I used to think it was to change the world. I used to think that, oh, we're going to just, once we get everybody thinking like this, then we're going to lead the charge and every, we're going to, we're going to overtake it and everything's going to be fine. But it was Gordon White in uh, his most recent pieces of eight. He has a line about the magician's goal is not necessarily to change the system because, you know, the old authority is the same as the new authority. You know, it's just a changing of face. You're never going to get out of that because there's a if you remove power then there's a power vacuum and somebody's going to get into it so it might be kind of fruitless to try to really change the system because even you'll recognize that alternative movements get infiltrated almost right away if they're not funded from the beginning they're infiltrated so quickly so good luck actually changing the system because by the time you get to the point where you know, you're actually a threat to the system, you're already going to be a part of it. Examples. Throw out some examples there because you're totally right. But sometimes when when people in your position yeah. say that, people are like, what do you mean? And I, I mean, I'll just throw out one that, that comes to mind and then you can jump on it with a bunch of others. But I remember hearing this interview not too long ago with Timothy Leary. And this is an interview he did back like a couple years right after he got out of jail. So yeah. it would have been like in the 70s. And he goes, you know, it's like, hey, you know, one thing I didn't realize until much later is – we had been infiltrated and co-opted within a very short period of time. Exactly what you're saying. So here is Timothy Leary, counterculture, you know, tune in, drop out, you know, all that, and infiltrated. And now in retrospect, he sees it. And I think, you know, that there's many examples that you've run across where people think, oh, no, we couldn't be infiltrated. And now you look and it's like, of course, they've been co-opted. Well, if you talk to Judy Wood, she thinks that half the 9-11 movement is the truth movement you know she thinks is infiltrated and it's meant to steer people away from her research and you know she'll say things like they're out there calling for a new investigation well here's the investigation you know we don't need a new investigation we need to look at the evidence of the ones that have been done so in a way it, it's like a cycle that'll never never end because um, they're calling for like the wrong conclusion or a different conclusion so I think that, I mean, in my life, I would say Occupy. I actually really liked the Occupy movement. I was down there. I was staying in a tent downtown. Um, oh, no, you can't trust your experience. Right. You don't really know what's happening to you. You're like... No, I think I know what's happening to me, but that's what that's part of the scientific overlay is until we've ordained it, oh, none of your experiences really matter. And and I do think you you you're so right. I think that is one of the really positive things that has come out of this psychedelic movement and all the ethnogens is that you can't bullshit those people. They're like, you know, blah blah blah. I don't care. I know I was there. And <clears throat> I think I'm just more immediate level, I, what I always say is, you know, is there a voice inside your head? And when you ask that question, you get an answer inside your head. And whether the answer is yes or no, who the hell was answering it? Yeah. There was something there. And, you know, I think what you're doing is just jump starting that conversation with that other aspect of yourself. So that's cool. So where where might that take you? How are you synthesizing that into some of the topics you covered about you cover and I think you've already laid out some of that groundwork but one of the things that intrigues me is if there are these other entities and some of these eminent entities are malevolent there's evil out there and anyone who doesn't think there's evil out there I mean you know there's people who abduct little kids and use them for these horrible sexual purposes. And lo and behold, we've come out. Some of those people are in the White House and in the highest government. If you don't believe that, look up the Franklin Affair and look up some other stuff that is just 
g- g- supremely tightly documented, you know, where the people who went, I never wanted to believe this. I wish I didn't encounter it, but this is the truth. But anyways, isn't that kind of chilling that there is this evil in this extended consciousness realm as well? So yeah. then that suggests that there is this higher battle that we're kind of engaged in. Right. What do you make of all that? There definitely might be spiritual puppet masters. It gets into the Peter Lavenda stuff, the sinister forces, as he refers to it. Uh, I really like that idea. The idea that not only are we messing with uh, a physical human elite, but we're also dealing with something on a higher plane or another dimension, another sliver of this reality that we don't necessarily see that also has great influence. I mean, who knows? How do you know why you do what you do, you know, on a daily basis? When you have an inkling to go do something, did that come from you or or did that come from somewhere else? Did somebody put that in your head? Are your thoughts your own? And that's where it gets into the idea that it's very important to get into meditation. It's very important to get into these uh, these spiritual practices that make you stronger minded so that you can actually identify your own thoughts from other thoughts. And that gets back to Gordon. Like he has uh, really opened my eyes to the idea of spiritual influence, not just in the sense that you know, George Bush might be doing some weird rituals with skull and bones and they might be contacting some entity that gives them ideas. Cause I, I used, I definitely think that kind of stuff happens. I think that's why they have rituals is because they're tapping into something. But I used to put it way out there and say, well, little old me isn't going to have those kind of experiences. Little old me isn't being influenced by these things. But any artist knows the concept of the muse. You know, that is a spiritual influence giving you information. And I used to want to be a stand up comic. And any good comic knows when they get on a roll, they'll all say, it doesn't feel like it's coming from me. It's coming through me, but it's coming from somewhere else. And they're tapping into a certain wavelength where they're getting creative inspiration on the fly and it's coming out and they're like, man, how did I come up with that? Yeah. How did you come up with that? You know, give that some thought because maybe it came from somewhere else. So, you know, the muse isn't necessarily bad, but just as people have a wide range of personalities and and agendas, I think the spirits might too. And it's a hard thing for me to rationalize when you get into life after death because, as Gordon has pointed out to me several times, there is a way to contact spirits and not just like these big ancient spirits or ancient gods that we think of, but your own ancestors. You know, And another thing he pointed out to me is that over the course of hu- the human timeline, it may seem very strange to have an ancestor altar and, and talk to your ancestors today, but the sliver of time where it isn't weird is, is a much, much larger. You know, the whole human timeline, we've paid homage to our ancestors, except for right now, you know. So we're stuck in a time where it seems weird, but actually we're the exception to that rule. And I've been getting into that a little bit more, but I have a hard time rationalizing, communicating with spirits, my own ancestors, with the idea that people come back with past life memories and... You know, how do we figure, how do we fit that piece in? You know, is my grandma always here to be accessed or is she being cycled in through another life? It's a big can of worms, man. But it, it is they a can of seem contradictory to it. To oh, they, they're all, I think, paradoxical as soon as you, you step into them. And I, I think that, you know, this is like skeptical kind of stuff that, that we've kind of explored. And I think there's a, there's a limit to, rational inquiry into those topics because I don't know, but it, it, it does seem to make sense to me that part of the way that the whole thing is structured is that we are going to have very limited access to that information. Yeah. And people are trying to work the system, you know, so bushes are going through the rituals and other people are going through these rituals and say, give me more, give me more access. But when you look at some of the spiritual seekers, the legitimate ones through time, what they've said is really kind of the opposite. They've said, avoid that. They don't say it's not real. They don't say you can't talk to the spirits. They don't say you can't develop these psychic abilities, for lack of a better term. What they say is that's not really going to get you anywhere where you really want to be. Of course, that's what they say. Well, I think there's a wisdom to that because I think that we do experience this treading water kind of thing. If there is, a, 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 you know, I just finished an interview with a near-death experience researcher who I, I really, really respect and appreciate, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long. And 
he did this book and we did the show on Skeptico and I got a lot of pushback right off the bat because the book is about God. This guy is not a religious guy. He is does not have a religious agenda. He's just following the NDE data. And when you follow the near-death experience data, what people say is God, hierarchy of consciousness. There is good. There is heading towards it. And what makes sense to me in that is that, yeah, we can play around down here with all this stuff, but we're just treading water. We're just, if we really want to advance, it takes something of a different order of magnitude, a different dimension. And that, so again, there's, you know, yeah, if you want to do that stuff, that's fine. But where are you really getting, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the whole, a lot of the nine to five reality, yeah, it's a money game for these people, but it also keeps us from developing ourselves further, from getting deeper. Again, with the psychedelics being illegal, these are the things that open you up to these new ideas, these strange ideas that get you start to reflect on your life, what you're doing here, where you can go with it, how much of it is manipulatable, can I manifest my own reality, how, to what degree does that work? Those are the things that I think people should be exploring, should be looking at, and we're really just trained not to. You know, meditation, you go to school for the first, you know, crucial decade of your life, is it ever brought up? Is it ever brought up that you should really reflect on your own mind and strengthen it and, you know, get in tune with your thoughts? Never. It's never. It's always just about that you are more. How about just that you are more than your thoughts? Right. You are more than just just never biological kind of robot thing that, that we talk about. It, it never comes up. It's it's so ridiculous. And in terms of, um, you know, some kind of spiritual presence, I, I consider myself pretty energetically dense. I've been to really haunted areas where people say they feel something. I don't feel anything. I appreciate it from a third party standpoint that there's probably something there. They're not all lying, but I don't experience much personally that isn't driven by psychedelics. But uh, a quick story, I was on this, uh, this tour to promoting this movie. We were going to a few different stops. This movie, Don Peyote, it's kind of like, um, you know, Hunter S. Thompson psychedelic thing. And we went to a few different premieres up and down the West Coast. And when we got to Big Sur, like, I knew getting on this bus that there was a good chance psychedelics were going to get involved. And I had said to myself, I'm kind of done with that. Like Timothy Leary says, when you get the message, hang up the phone. <laughs> I don't need anything but weed anymore. I don't really want to go down there. So I was pretty much guarded and had made my mind up. I might take a cap or something, a mushroom maybe, but I'm not going to go deep. And it's, the world had other plans for me, man, because I'd never done LSD. I've done a lot of things, not LSD in particular. And we get picked up by this mom and daughter. And they're driving us through the woods of Big Sur. And then they tell us that they're on LSD, that they had found at a concert. This, And I'm like, you're driving us on LSD with your daughter? And from a perspective of, uh, you know, a spiritual world manipulating me, they put me in like the safest environment. They tricked me. It was total trickery because... It, it was the most comfortable, safest way to introduce this to me because I'm like, okay, this mom and daughter, they're, they're, you know, very disarming. You know, they seem together. And so they're like, here, we'll give you a hit. And I'm like, okay, 40 minutes later, I don't feel anything. They give me another hit. I take five hits of this acid. And then when I, it's the second I'm separated from the group, it all hits me like a ton of bricks and I'm way out of my mind and I'm at a level I did not want to get to. And I felt like when I reflect back on that, I felt played from a higher level. I felt like these, these were kind of, uh, you know, actors who were put in place to kind of in a Truman Show way, uh, make me comfortable with the idea that I already decided I was like definitely not going to go down that route. And when it was all said and done at three o'clock in the morning, when everybody's passed out and I'm wide awake and peaking on acid, I look up at this, this particular star and this star basically in a, in a, you know, consciousness to consciousness way was like, Hey man, what's going on? Here's, here's what's going on in my entire life. And I saw, you know, I, time was going, who knows how much time it took, but a star walked me through the timeline of its existence and the planets that have been revolving around it. And, oh, we had life pop up on this one for a little while and then it went away. Uh, this one ran into that one. And then like, it showed me all this in a matter of like 10 minutes. And I was like, this is what the ancients were doing. You know, this right here, what I'm experiencing now, this is how it works. You know, when, when they, 
the fact that all our gods coordinate with celestial bodies, this to me is getting right at the heart of what, what they were all about. So I felt like this experience played me and it got me to this particular note on, of understanding. And that was the purpose. And with the Lavenda, with the Peter Lavenda stuff, that's kind of my own personal experience where I'm like, yeah, there are spiritual forces that do influence things and they, they can manipulate you. And people always talk about practicing mindfulness. That's a part of mindfulness, you know, being in the moment, all these buzzwords really do consider it and consider why, you know, you've made certain choices in your life. And you'll find that there are puppet strings on us in all kinds of ways, spiritual, you know, conspiratorial, you know, there's a lot going on that people are not paying attention to, but that just, that whole experience to me was like, okay, I get, I get a lot of what, when you see these pyramids aligned to Orion's belt and you see these references to the stars, okay, now I see how they could actually communicate. And that's maybe an animist perspective that all living things have a consciousness and like, how could you communicate with a star, you stupid hippie? Well, I don't know, but that's the experience I had. Well, I think it's it's awesome, and I think it's it's hard to challenge on a number of different levels. You know what else I took away from that story is, to me, you hit upon, I think, one of the really great things that you do with the higher side chats, and that the conspiratorial worldview, if you will, is all about that story. You know, it's opening up to experience more. It's letting the, the camera lens open up and then still filtering it, but not filtering it until it comes all the way in. Yeah. So it, it, as we wrap up, t t talk more about what you've learned about conspiracy theory, if you will, in terms of how it relates to other aspects of life, which I think that is a great example, as is your whole willingness and openness to say, hey, you know what? I threw spirituality out the window and I shouldn't have. I'm going to let it back in because I'm into paradigm busting, which is really what conspiracy theory is all about. Definitely. And one, one aspect is that it's important to separate data from interpretation. I know you talk about a lot of data here. That's a, you know, that line is something Gordon has just drilled into my head. Uh, he's been a pretty good mentor, to tell you the truth. But um, you have you can you have to be able to when you're listening to a guy talk for two hours about the research, you have to be able to say, okay, where was the research and where was the spin you put on it? You know, because you can look at the same data and come to different conclusions. So it is important to separate data from conclusion, not to go too off the rails on some of their interpretations and conclusions when the data doesn't necessarily get you there. So that's kind of an important aspect of it. The other thing is singular narratives. Uh, I am very attracted to singular narratives. The idea that I want to, I want to figure out who is the capstone of the pyramid. That's who it is. And there, and everything else is underneath them. And I think that in the conspiratorial mind is uh, something that a lot of people gravitate to. It's, is it the Jews? Is it the secret Nazis? Is it, you know, the Jesuits, is it something on the spiritual plane? Is it Satan? Well, maybe it's a lot of stuff. Maybe there's multiple power centers. Maybe there is a Jewish power center that controls aspects of banking and is trying to get to the top of the pyramid, while there's also elements of Nazis from Project Paperclip that are now obviously most of the American government. Let's talk about that for a minute, because that's a, a really, you know, a lightning rod issue to go into. One is... I think the, the Jewish issue and the Zionist issue is really good one to talk about on a couple of levels. Because first, we're real comfortable deconstructing Christianity and saying, oh, well, that's just a mind control meme, you know, yeah. clearly there. But do we go and say, well, the New Testament and the Jewish thing and the uh, Jehovah nonsense. Oh, no, that that somehow stands apart from it. Well, of course it doesn't. There's no way it could. And once you walk into those waters, then I think we have to have a different really orientation about what we mean when we say Jewish. And when we mean that, I think a lot of times what we're talking about are secular Jewish 
people with a Jewish tradition in the United States who mainly identify with two things. They identify with the Holocaust and they identify with Israel. And that's totally understandable. I'm not I'm not criticizing that at all. Those are two huge uh, events. One, the, the Holocaust thing is, is an important event. And I think, you know, these Holocaust deniers are interesting, too. I mean, that's a whole other thing you can get into because a couple of them slip in here and there. I think a couple of them have slipped into your shows. You know, I think it's just complete bullshit because history doesn't support it. And when you really push those people, their arguments just sound so lame. It's like, well, they didn't really kill the, the Nazis, didn't really kill 6 million, they killed 4 million. It's like, really? That's where you're going to want to kind of draw your whole thing on? I mean, when they say, look, it wasn't death camps, they were work camps. Yeah. What's wrong with work camps? <laughs> yeah, right. and I'm like, you know, work camps are much better. You want to be in one? They're like, you know, why would they tattoo the arms if they were just going to kill everybody? It's like, well, you're right. They were work camps, but they'll work you till you die. And then they'll just throw you in the fire pit. You know, I spoke to a guy, and you had him on your show, uh, Jan Irwin. Jan. Jan. I'm sorry. Jan Irwin. And he didn't reveal himself He didn't reveal himself to you as being this kind of Holocaust denier. I hate the word denier, but, I mean, that's the term that we have. But he did to me because I was going to interview him, and he starts feeding me all this stuff. And I'm like... I'm like you are. I mean, I'm open mind, man. I'll listen to anybody. You know, I'm not turned off. You know, oh, Holocaust, uh, you know, didn't happen. Great. You know, show me the stuff. So we start exchanging emails back and forth. And I just sent him the, you know, there's a movie, strangely enough, named Conspiracy that was out about 10 years ago. And it's this movie about this meeting that they had when they were plotting the final solution. So they had all the highest ranking Nazi guys there. And amazingly, we have a transcript, a real legitimate transcript from that. Well, they're planning, they're clearly planning the final solution. All these guys are still going to sit around and they're saying, well, how can we do it? We can put them all in the trucks and we can send the, the gas in that way. And it's this. And they're also dealing with the problem that, that hey, that the German army, not that they're great or that they should be let off the hook, but they're like, you know, they're not really liking killing all these Jewish people. Or they're like, hey, you know, with killing civilians, it's not like what we signed up for. You know, right. hey, we have to find another way to do this. So these guys are problem solving. They're good German problem solvers, you know. And however we want to spin that, we can spin it. But that's what I, I hit Jan with. I go like, okay, well, what about this? I mean, this seems to, and again, it's just like all the other stuff we talk about. It's like a total deflection, doesn't want to go there, doesn't want to incorporate it in. It's like, no, I don't have a, a, I'm not of a Jewish tradition, so I don't really have a dog in this fight. I don't believe that Yahweh, that crazy thunder God that was him and his wife, people were worshiping in, and then we kind of slipped that into being this J Judaism, monotheism, it's all bullshit, so I don't have any attachment to that. I'm just looking at history the way it is. But when you look at the Zionist thing, it kind of looks a lot different. And one of the things I appreciate about your show is that you're willing to go there. Well, you know, what was going on with those kids, those Mossad kids who were across the river in New Jersey and were set up to videotape the 9-11? What is Mossad doing there? But and I'd be interested in this is a long rant, but interested in, in what you're here. How anyone can look at that and say, OK, so the Mossad is involved in 9-11. Their fingerprints are all over it, it seems to me. But they're clearly not pulling the strings, right? I mean, I can't put that together. I mean, the Bushes look a lot, and maybe the Bushes, like you suggested with Russ Baker, maybe they're just the water boys for somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> but clearly, uh, Mossad is the water boys for the Bushes, because the Bushes have the Saudis doing one thing, and they have the Mossad doing another. So yeah. when you talk about this pyramid, or, or what did you say, the primary source of the primary thing. I mean, they ain't up there on the top. We have to keep climbing. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's way more complicated than people, than the single narrative hypothesis, which is like, it is the, you know, X, Y, or Z group that is at the top. It's actually a huge mix. And there's a bunch of diff just, one of the easiest things to realize is that there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. Right. It's a false paradigm. That's Completely. One of 101 understandings. Well, Take that further and say there's not much of a difference between other groups like Mossad or the CIA. Like they're, I think that a lot of these groups are kind of set in opposition and they might not be just in some degree behind the curtain. You know, they might be run by the same organizations to, to some degree. I mean, you got your think tanks, your Council on Foreign Relations, your Bilderbergs. Yeah, the Trilateral Commission. 
these think tanks have huge influence and you can find members of them in all these different groups. So it is weird, but with the, with the World War II Nazi thing, there, I think that's a, a deeper story than we're probably ever going to know. And I think it gets back into bloodlines and, you know, what this whole can of esoteric knowledge because Hitler wanted what? Blonde hair, blue eyes. He doesn't even have that. So this is very strange. And then you have UFO encounters where people are like, Oh, there's a bunch of little grays and then one tall Nordic blonde haired, blue eyed being. Well, what the fuck is going on there? You know, the Nazis had the secret technology. They're messing with, um, you know, mercury rotation engines and the Nazi bell. This is getting close to the flying saucers that spin and anti gravity seems to be very connected to this. Uh, you know, blocked off quarantine part of physics. So it is strange why a guy would be so hell bent on destroying just a, one race and trying to engineer people to look a certain way. I well, but, but I think that's kind of a misreading. I mean, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Also in 1492, Spain threw out all the Jewish people in their country. Yeah. So there has been this long-standing kind of hatred of has, of these people. And, why is that, do you think? Oh, is well, it just racial? I don't think it is. Well, I, I personally, and then that gets into, a, I mean, there's many, many people have explored this in many different dimensions. One, it's, a, it's an anti-Christian thing, right? So for hundreds of years, we set up, and these are people who killed Christ, you know, they're the bad guys. <clears throat> and I think just from a cultural standpoint, you look at it and they kind of turned it to their favor. They said, okay, we're different. We're going to be good with being different. We're going to promote being different. We're on the outsider group and we're going to build around a certain amount of values, those values, education, money, and these other things. And we're going to look for gaps in the system like, hey, you guys don't think lending money is a good thing. No problem for us. We'll lend money. And just it's just any group would have done that who was an outsider group who didn't have to play the game. There's certain advantages that. And then when you focus on education, it's too, it's also to your advantage. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just saying that to me is a reasonable explanation for why you get this outsider group that then continues to have conflict with the main group and is hated by the main group. But maybe, you know, it's understandable from some very basic reasons. But I, as far as Hitler, you know, executing this kind of final solution being all that, I mean, no one else would take the Jewish people, right? I mean, there's all this, there's this huge prejudice in the United States and in all these other countries. So it, to a certain extent, I think Hitler was like, hey, we're all in the same boat, right? We all hate these Jewish people, you know, and then it, it turns on him. People are like, well, no, not like that, you <laughs> idiot, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm totally right. making it up. I mean, I, I don't know either, but you know, you can go down the road of, you know, the Rothschild power center and that this being the head of a Jewish banking system System that is fractional reserve banking, which is obviously debt based, which kind of enslaves a nation. And when you go to those. But I think that's way overblown. That's kind of bullshitty in a way, because, you know, otherwise, the, the, how else are you going to do it? Right. You're going to print money. So you're going to have the government print money. Or you're going to have somebody else print money. Now, I think the, the Federal Reserve is a total sham. And I think it, it's for all the reasons. But this idea of fractional currency, I think it's really, really gets spun out of control. It's like we all want to do that. We have a we have a desire to kind of uh, have money and have the ability to lend out money. And, the, you know, that's why you only have to put 10 percent down to buy a house. Well, that's the same way that the bank is doing it. The, the, that part of it, to me, I think it's overblown when people say, you know, debt is the problem. It's like, hey, you want me to loan you 20 bucks for lunch? I'll do it. But then if you want to turn around and say, oh, but we shouldn't charge any interest for that. You shouldn't get anything back. Like I say, there's a time value of money. So debt is, I think it just gets whacked out there in a way. I see what you're saying. It is, it is part of the system. There has to be an incentive to lend somebody money. You have to get something back than what you already had. But I don't really think it's overblown because it's, it's debt that keeps a lot of people in line. And there's many different banking structures. If you study that, like there's public banking. North Dakota has it, its own public I was just going to say. Right. So so North Dakota. Let's say North Dakota. To me, North Dakota is the model, right? It but is. they still have fractional uh, fractional banking. They still lend but all yeah, that. One thing that the conspiracy theorists always talk about is the debt cannot be paid. An individual's debt because only the bank prints money. So think of it as like a game of musical chairs. 
when the bank breaks off money and charges interest, that interest, the, the money to cover that interest doesn't exist. It hasn't been printed because if they print a million dollars and lend it out and they want 10% interest, you know, where does that other money come? And the point is, is that it'll never be paid and there will always be people on the hamster wheel who can't get out of debt. And that keeps you from going out in the street and protesting because you got to get to work tomorrow because that mortgage is due. And it keeps people in a subservient position. Student loan debt is the number one thing the millennials are going through right now. As we were sold this bill of goods that to get a good job, you have to go into debt. And now there's no jobs to get. And we're still on the hook for all this money. So I think I, I hear you, but I think we're sense. spinning a couple. And I think this is one of the problems with what they do here is they're kind of spinning a couple of different things. Like you can never repay the debt is true from a systemic kind of global system. But who the fuck cares about that? The you can re out. no, you can repay your debt. I I live in a really nice house. I have yeah. excess money. I get interest on on investments all over the place. I can repay my debt. But they I'm, know that most they know that like the blank if you're running the country, you know that only a fraction of people are going to get to that level. I think that's one of the dangers of this conspiracy stuff is it it can become an excuse to look at our our real stuff which is you know what that wasn't a good decision for me to stay in San Diego it wasn't a good decision for me to take that job I should have taken this other job I shouldn't have leased that car I should have driven my other car two years longer and you know I should have figured out a way to work the, you know what I'm saying and it can be a blame mechanism of like you know I'm in a shitty position because the Rothschild set this exactly up and now I'm fucked and exactly. I, I definitely get that and I think that there is uh, you know we do give a little bit too much power to the idea that you can't make it because of the system right and that's what I was saying earlier. Like I wanted to get an accurate uh, view of the game we're playing. And then I wanted to be like, okay, now that I see the game for what it is, not what I was taught in school, but what it actually is, now I can move my pieces a little better. And instead of just waiting for the revolution and the Occupy movement to, to make out all my problems go away, I'm going to have to do this my own way. And I have, you have, but I still... You know, look at every intersection in San Diego and see four homeless people begging for change. And, you know, you can chalk that up to laziness or not making the right decisions. But I think that when you get the macro view, when you look at the institutors of the Federal Reserve, the institutors of the system, they're concerned with keeping their power and making sure that the masses don't rise up against them. And if you let some outliers through and have success, that's not going to really do anything to hurt you. But if the masses were to all of a sudden, everybody takes mushrooms and says, yeah, what the fuck are we doing? This is all bullshit. You know, then there might be an actual uprising. If people were to say, hey, this debt that I'm in is really just a number on a screen. It doesn't mean anything like it's just green paper. It's monopoly money. A lot of the way they do control us by creating this paradigm and making it an uphill battle. You know, we're like salmon trying to swim upstream like it does. It is like a flow to, to knock you down. And some of us make it, you know, some of us make it up there. But from their view, I think they know that the masses, you know, you go back to the Midwest, you know, every friend I grew up with, they don't believe in the conspiracy bullshit and they have a regular nine to five job and ignorance is bliss. And that's what I think the system is kind of set up to do. And that's what I think debt does is debt is just one more brick in the wall to keep you from actually developing because it's a huge stress on basically everybody. I mean, the number one reason that marriages fall apart is because of paper money. I mean, it's a little silly. I think that's why I think that's an important piece of the puzzle to really like get your head around because it does affect people quite a bit. Well, I, th I think you're right. And the one thing I'd, I'd say about the, the debt issue is I think it's very true on a personal level, but I think balancing that out with like you can acknowledge that it's an uphill battle and that you're salmon swimming upstream, but that doesn't mean you should stop swimming. And you have to, you know, for yourself, get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm not stuck in this debt-based system of rule. I see it. I see that it's very tempting to get into. And once it's got your hooks in, once it's got its hooks in, it's very hard to get out, but you still can. Like you, you know, on an individual basis, don't think you're defeated because you're up against this monolith that you can't ever overcome. 
you just have to be creative. You just have to. I would agree with that. And, and the other thing that I was going to add is, you know, the advantage of kind of confronting some of these things like you're talking about is you also have to, I think, separate out what is just doing business and what is really conspiratorial. Because as a, a savvy person, like you couldn't have done all the things that you're done with the higher side chats. It's not easy to do a podcast and to be successful with it and then to be financially successful with it. Wow. It's not easy to swim up. I mean, a lot of people, you talk about swimming upstream, would see that as an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you've done it. And I think there's a crossover there between we're all confronted with doing uh, tough things and hard things. And it doesn't help to sit around and kind of worry about how hard it is. You just kind of kind of take the perspective of I'm the one salmon who is going to make it up that stream. Right. I think in a lot of ways that's a lot more empowering. In a lot of ways, it's not more it's a lot more realistic because we don't really know what those other salmon are doing or thinking. Right. We just have to be our own salmon. Yeah. And you're stuck in your own stream like you're the only one responsible for your rent. So it really doesn't matter you know, what your neighbors are doing or what they're into. Like, we all are fighting an individual fight, which I think is another part of the control paradigm. Like, you know, it's hard to get a group together. It's hard to, you know, get a big revolution going when we are, are all fighting an individual battle because no one's going to put themselves out there too far because, what, are you going to pay my rent when I get arrested for your cause? I don't think so. You know, I got to make sure I eat. And that, again, is like, I think it's so well crafted that's where i get conspiratorial as i do think like it isn't an accident that it's crafted exactly like it is and it's for ultimate control and it's hard to control six seven billion people and make sure that they're all doing exactly what you want but you can put the pressure on them that most people won't rise past luckily we have you know fingers crossed we say that way i i like to say you know when i moved to san diego it was to grow weed that was my big get out of jail plan uh, and I'm probably the one guy in the world who couldn't make money growing weed and can make money on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be an awesome way to wrap it up. Greg, it's been absolutely super having you on Skeptico. I'm sure we'll stay in touch and find other ways maybe to collaborate because I think that the conspiratorial worldview that you bring to things it extends far beyond what people normally think about just conspiracies and extend into these personal transformation things that I'm so excited about. So awesome, awesome having you on. Thank yeah, you man. so much. Thanks for having me. You know, I don't feel worthy. I see your guest list and, you know, I'm just a simple minded Midwestern college dropout stoner. What do I know? But hey, I appreciate it so much, man. You do the humble card pretty good, man. <laughs> but I know the real story. OK, great. <laughs> hey, everybody, I hope you liked the video. If you want more, please check out the website. All sorts of stuff on consciousness, science, spirituality, skepticism, many, many interviews, all over 300 of them on the website. So be sure to check it out. Also, subscribe, like, do all that good stuff. Tell other people about it so we can spread the word about Skeptic Co. Thank you. Bye.